Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction and first of all the invitation to speak here. Um, so I'll talk about uh, subgroup analysis uh, with some focus on early phase trials. And um, what I'll talk about is based on joint work with Marius Thomas, as you can see here. And we've also put a technical report about this on, on archive. So essentially everything that I'll talk about is, is part of also this this paper, at least the, method, the methods and the simulations that I present. <coughs> so maybe to start with something uh, lighthearted. I don't know if you've seen that. It's from XKCD. I, probably the ones in the back can't read it. It's on the left-hand side, you can see uh, p-values, uh, highly significant p-value. And then at some point, it goes higher and higher. And at, in the last resort, is essentially, uh, if it's larger than 0.1, hey, look at this interesting. Uh, subgroup analysis. Of course, if you're a statistician, uh, you find that funny. I found it funny, but why is it funny? I think it's funny because it's actually describing the truth pretty well. And I know that everyone who has ever done such an analysis has done it with sort of a headache or a bad feeling because you know if you're looking at multiple subgroups, if you're starting really to search for a subgroup, at some point you'll find something and the challenge is really uh, how to interpret, interpret um, that finding. And that's really the starting point. That's my, what my presentation is about. Um, how to deal with that situation. If you looked at multiple subgroups and you found something, is there a way of somehow adjusting uh, for, for the selection that you have done? OK, so that's the outline for the presentation uh, for today. I'll start with a bit of overview of subgroup analysis. Um, what's been going on in the past few months and years, and some of the challenges. And then I'll just introduce you three methods for deriving adjusted treatment effect estimates. I'll spend most time maybe on model averaging, because it's not so obvious how it can help here, but actually it can help. And then I'll talk about more classical methods like resampling, where you have test and training data, and um, penalized multivariate regression. And I'll also show you some simulation results. OK, I think it's fair to say that subgroup analysis is at the moment a sort of a hot topic. Um, the EMA has released a draft guidance in 2014. And we're expecting that the final version will come out um, this year. <coughs> On the US side, uh, we have this precision medicine initiative. And it's also clear that the FDA has a working group on subgroup analysis. Um, I don't know whether they also publish a guidance, but at least they published some papers, or they are publishing papers on subgroup analysis. And just by looking at this list of uh, sort of re review articles that appeared in the past few months in the statistics journals, it's, you know, it's, it's clear that it's a pretty, pre pretty favorable topic at the moment. But before going into the methods, I first try to explain what sort of subgroup analysis I'll talk about. because. The word subgroup analysis might stand for very different things, and I just want to make it clear what I'll talk about in, in the next few slides. Because I will not talk about uh, the fully confirmatory setting. That means where you pre-specify a subgroup, you have a multiple testing strategy in place, you have the adequate sample size for that subgroup. I will not talk about that. I will also not talk about, which has also been a hot topic in the past uh, few years, as adaptive enrichment designs and so on. I, I will talk about more the setting where you have an early phase trial. It might be a proof of concept trial. So phase 2A, we call that in, in, at Novartis. And you perform these sort of subgroup analysis almost uh, routinely in, in these trials. You might also perform this sort of analysis in later trials, but then at a more at an exploratory basis. And that means that the sample size that you calculated for your study um, is not based on looking at subgroup, it's based on the overall population. And I think that's maybe the first challenge of, uh, with those analysis I'll, that I'll talk about. Have you pre-specified the subgroups? Well, you know, this is an early phase trial. You might not know which, which variables are the important ones. So maybe there might be a list of uh, covariates that you have predefined, but uh, that doesn't need to be like that. I mean, it could also be that during the course of the trial, you find some other covariates that might be interesting. So there's no strict pre-specification of subgroups. How many covariates? So I'm not 
talking here about the very big um, personalized medicine scenario, but I'm more talking about the standard analysis that are being more often done, where you would maybe look at 5 to 30 covariates um, and what type of covariates. It might be clinical variables primarily. It could also be demographic covariates, but it also might be some genetic covariates or some biomarkers. And I think it's important to know that usually you would only include those variables if you already believe that there could be some, some sort of effect. I mean, something that's completely unrelated, you wouldn't put into this kind of uh, subgroup analysis. So what's the aim of these analysis? Um, well, to identify a group that might respond better, more sensitive population, super responders, however you might want to call it. Um, but one other point is here that you, you know, to, to, find, to try to find a subgroup of patients with increased treatment effect, but you would then confirm it in later, later trials. So that's not the end of the story. Something else would come later on. So the consequences of such an analysis, if you found something, is you, you might continue development in the overall population and you just keep an eye on the subgroup. You might enrich the, sub, the population if you have, you know, if you're more comfort, you know, if you have more belief that it's actually something real. And then the final point would be the development in the subgroup only. I mean, it doesn't only depend on the analysis that you have done. It also depends on a lot of other circumstances on what of these three uh, approaches you might take in later stage trials. Okay, so um, let's get started with. Uh, oops. Actually, this does not work. Let's get started with um, with with the notation. So that's uh, a statistical model that I'd just like to introduce. I mean, I'm showing it here for normally distributed data, but um, and it doesn't matter. It could be any endpoint for this. I just show one example here. And it's a very simple model. You have a placebo effect, beta 0, and a treatment effect, beta 1. And TI is just whether the patient got treatment or not. So we're assuming a two-arm trial here with control and treatment. And then how, how subgroup analysis basically are being performed is that you have a subgroup indicator where you have a one if a patient is in the subgroup, zero if it's a complement, and then you essentially add this as covariates on the intercept and then the slope parameter here. So you might add it as a um, prognostic covariate. So if it's changing the placebo effect, it's called a prognostic variable, and you might also add it as a, um, a covariate on the treatment effect. That means it would be a predictive covariate. And primarily, of course, you're interested in those patients that have a changed um, treatment effect. So in the predictive, uh, predictive subgroups, that's what you're interested in. And then the standard approach of how these analyses are often done is that you essentially you have not just one subgroup indicator here. You have multiple subgroup indicators. And for all of those, you will fit this sort of model. Compare the effect that you get in the subgroup. Maybe you also look at, so, so beta 3 is here. So that's the effect in the subgroup. Beta 1 is the effect in the complement of the subgroup. So beta 3 is the difference between subgroup and complement. You might also look into you know, what's the evidence that there's actually a difference between the two um, uh, subgroup and complement, and look at the p-value for the interaction test. So, then, and then you can choose a subgroup or a model based on the magnitude of the treatment effect in the subgroup. Or what's, I think, more commonly done is that you look at the p-value for the interaction test, as I said, because it's not only looking for an effect, it's also incorporating the variability in some sense. So because here you will have a penalization in some sense towards groups of equal size, whereas this is just looking for a high treatment effect. And I think uh, everyone in this room knows that. Um, but of course, the challenge with this approach is that when you search for a group with an increased treatment effect, uh, at some point, you will find something, um, but you will find, find something by chance. Or you might alternatively view it as a sort of an overfitting. If you're trying multiple structures, at some point, a structure will fit your observed data. But what you are fitting is really fitting noise. It's not really fitting an underlying structure. So, and, of, and due to that, the treatment effect estimate will typically be upwards biased. 
And of course, the problem gets worse the more subgroups uh, you look at. And of course, if you include subgroups of low uh, plausibility. OK, because before, I, um, before I go to the different methods, just one word on continuous covariates and, and categorization, because I know it's a topic that's always being discussed. Uh, it has been discussed a lot in the literature, so I, I think I have to say something on that here. So I think in, in practice and for clinical convenience, even if the co covariate might be continuous, often a subgroup might be defined in terms of, the, of a cutoff. But that doesn't mean that you use your modeling in terms of a continuous covariate. So you could use a continuous covariate, but still define a subgroup based on, on, a, on, a, on a cutoff. That's the first point I try to make. The second point is that in what follows in this presentation is all based on this categorization approach. But that doesn't matter. The focus of the presentation is to come up with a just a treatment effect estimate. And the method works no matter whether you adjust for covariates in a continuous or categorized way. The main point is to, you know, to, to, to come up with these adjusted treatment effect estimates. Actually, we, we also looked into the continuous setting um, uh, with a spline modeling approach, and the things work, you know, you see a similar improvement. Um, but for, for what follows in this presentation, I'll talk about this categorization approach, just to, to state that more clear. And actually, I think um, we can also make it interactive. If there are any comments or questions, raise your hand and... and, and, and um, um, ask a question or make the comment. Okay, so let's start with this model averaging. Why, why could this be useful in this subgroup um, analysis um, setting? Well, because as you've seen, the standard approach is essentially you're looking at multiple models and you're picking one and disregarding all others. So you could see the subgroup selection problem is sort of like a model selection problem. And for these sort of problems, in the Bayesian statistics, there's a standard to solution to it, and this is model averaging. And instead of saying, well, I pick one model and disregard everything else, forget about that all the other models might also have some plausibility. So this would be like setting the posterior model probabilities to one for this one model and for the, to zero for all others. I'm saying, well, all these models have some plausibility, so I just, it should account for that. So I, I mean, they all fit the data to some extent. And, and as soon as you start doing that, you'll get adjusted inference. And this adjusted inference actually works, works quite well, as you see, see later on. So it's a pretty simple idea. It's just applying the standard recipe of, of Bayesian statistics. I think Berger was one of the uh, authors who, who proposed it in this setting. But I think it, it, it's one of the general recipe of Bayesian statistics. So to just, just to make it a little bit more clear, uh, on one slide, what's the general idea of model averaging? If you have a candidate set of statistical models and you are interested in a specific quantity, a parameter, theta, that you can derive under each model, then you can use every model to derive that estimate and you derive some additional weights, WK, so that would be the posterior model probabilities, and then you use not only the estimate from one model, but you use all of the models in sort of a weighted inference. And this will, I will explain to you how this will lead to um, um, adjusted uh, treatment effect estimates. Are you interested in treatment effect or are you interested in identifying which subgroup? No, you no. Future? So I, for this one, so I split this up. Uh, for this one, I'm only looking at, let's assume someone selected a subgroup. I'm the interest in coming up with adjusted treatment effect estimates. So I'll not talk about much about the subgroup identification itself. But in the simulations, we'll use some subgroup identification method. But um, the main point of the presentation is to come up with an adjusted um, estimate. I mean, of course, in, this, in, this, in the model averaging world, you might argue, well, you have to select one group. Maybe that's where, where your question is coming from. Yes, you can still select one group that you go forward. But you can use this model to um, perform, to, to get up with an adjusted treatment effect estimate. Of course, in reality, you have to decide for one thing. You cannot average everything. That's clear. But you can still use that to, to come up with an adjusted estimate. <clears throat> OK, and that's essentially what I've said before already. You have candidate subgroups, and you're fitting all these models where they essentially differ only in this term SI here. <clears throat> 
and yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the interpretation of the intercept will be different if you have a different subgroup. Oh, it should have, yes. Yeah, good catch. Yes, it should have, yeah. It was too quick. So the question now is, when you have all these models, how can you come up with a... Um, with a let, let's assume you're interested in a specific subgroup, SK. How can you derive a treatment effect estimate for that subgroup? Well, under model MK, as I said, the effect is just beta 1K plus beta 3K. And for the complement, it's like this. But if you fit a different subgroup model, it's not so obvious how to come up with an estimate for subgroup SK. Let's say you fit the model K prime, which is using SK prime here. How can you come up with a treatment effect estimate? And because you need that for model averaging. Because for one subgroup, you, will, you would need an estimate under each model. And the essential idea is here to say, well, let's assume we have fitted model MK prime here. How can I come up with an estimate for this group SK? Well, what I can do is I can predict the treatment effect for every patient in the subgroup. And every patient in the subgroup K will either be in the, also in the subgroup K prime, so I would predict this, or it will be in the complement of subgroup K prime, so I would predict that. So the treatment effect for subgroup SK under the model MK prime is just something like this, uh, where this W here is essentially the proportion of patients that are, off, that are in the subgroup K that are also in subgroup K prime. And this W, of course, this is a number between 0 and 1. And using this idea, you can, for every subgroup, you can get an estimate under each model for this specific subgroup. And that means you can utilize uh, model averaging. Because for every subgroup, under every model, you can predict the treatment effect. And that's what you need for model averaging. So just to give you an idea on, on how that might look like, I like graphs. Um, so let's assume this, you are interested in this subgroup. And this is the model that corresponds to that subgroup. And here you can see, it doesn't matter what it is on the x-axis here, you have the largest treatment effect of minus 25 for that model. But you can also utilize the other subgroup models to predict the effect for this subgroup. And you can see that depending on the overlap between, um, between the two subgroups, you would predict a similarly high effect. For example, here for model 8, you almost also predict minus 25. But for other models, you predict an effect close to, close to 0. And the essential idea of model averaging is not to just pick this model, forget about all others, but weight them according to how likely they are based on the data, and then come up with a weighted estimate. And you can see that in this case, um, there is some downweighting of the effect. So if I would only look at the model defining the subgroup, I would have an effect of minus 25. Here you can see it's more like minus 15, because these other models have some plausibility as well. But in principle, it would be possible to get sort of unadjusted inference when the posterior model probability would be 1 for, this, um, for the model that I'm interested in. Those other models are from patients who are belonging to both, both uh, the model of interest. Is, is it from the... Yeah. It's the same data. No, it's the same data, you but a different subgroup. I uh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you could switch on that microphone yeah. and... Uh, I can, I can, yes, I can. No, I'm sorry, Bjorn, I'm just, just for clarification, yes. uh, the patients in those other models are the patients who are common to uh, yes. both subgroups. Yes, is, so is that these are all models for the complete data set. Oh, these are for the complete data set. Every model is for the complete data set. It's just that you have a different um, subgroup indicator in there. Okay. So the way they differ is that they have... All these models are this, I see. but they have different SI. Different SI. Yeah. And it's for the same endpoint. Yes, yes, yeah. Is it because there are <coughs> different sets of pre-specified uh, candidate subgroups for one particular, you know, how, how would they differ? Uh, what differ? differ the, the subgroups. Uh, yeah, for example, it could be, once you're looking into 
uh, a subgroup defined in terms of baseline severity. It could be a subgroup that have a certain biomarker. And of course, every patient has, you can measure that on every patient, but you're trying to find, for example, if subgroup is defined in terms of um, baseline FEV1 predicted in an asthma study, for example, or um, in terms of some other clinical covariates. I mean, it's, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that you have different candidate subgroups, but it's always a model for the complete data set. But if it's a real, if it's a real subgroup, that you would have a posterior model probability that's getting close to one. So, so the composition of the subgroups are different? Yeah. One of the um, things you've got in your equations is the, the proportion of patients who are common to the subgroup yes. in one model yes, yes, and yes. in another model. And if, the, if there's good reason to think those things are highly correlated, that might be a reasonably um, robust statistic. But if they're not correlated, that could vary a lot from one sample to another. Mm -hmm. D does your model take account of the uncertainty in that yeah. overlap? Yeah. So I think... Uh, that's a good point. Maybe I'll come back to that later because I think it's an important point. If you have many subgroups that are essentially measuring the same thing, you will have a large overlap between the subgroups. But th that means you will have, and that makes sense because then you will have less shrinkage because you're essentially s specifying just one subgroup if they are all overlapping. And that, that's, the model is taking it, that into account. <coughs> Okay, a lot of questions, that's good. Yeah, my name is uh, Shakar Hussein. Um, uh, my question related to the subgroup, so they are not independent of each other. No. So you have the patient can be repeated in group two, subgroup two, subgroup three, and, and so on. Or may not it's appear. Always, the, the sub, by subgroup, I mean you're always splitting the total population in two parts. And you have different ways of splitting the total population in two parts. So, yeah. So, so it's, not, it's not like a kind of a multi-level where you have at, at the upper level no. subgroup one. So you generate an index for each subgroup. And then within each index, you have patient related to that specific group. No, it's not, yeah, no, it's always, it's subgroup, I mean, always different ways of split, splitting the total population in two parts, yeah. yes. It's not one, it's not like the hierarchical setting. I think there was another question here. No, it was just, about, just for me and the okay. For example, that would be one way, yes, yes. But you could also say, whether the patient used a certain previous medication or not, or whatever, it could be, it could be anything. And, and how does this, how does this, um, how, how do you induce shrinkage with this approach? It's not obvious. Um, the way it works is that for every model, you predict your estimate for the, your, your subgroup that you're interested in is bounded by this and by this. This is the effect in the complement into the subgroup under this model. That means if you look at many subgroups, for most of these subgroups, the difference will be close to zero because they will not fit the data. They will not be plausible subgroups. And when you predict the effect for the other subgroup based on these models, you will essentially predict the overall effect. But as long as these models have some plausibility, as long as these have some posterior probability, you will have some shrinkage towards the overall effect. So the main driver in the shrinkage is really the posterior model probabilities. If a subgroup has a very high posterior probability, there will be little or no shrinkage. But as soon as you start introducing more and more and more and more subgroups, of course, you're splitting your prior probability into more, more spaces and your, as any specific model will have less prior and also less posterior probability, that means you have more shrinkage in, 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 in when, it, when you include more subgroup. And it's sort of you're taking into account the multiplicity, you might say, automatically. And also, that's, um, I mean, this is the direction your question was going. It's not quite that, but it's the direction. If you have many similar subgroups that are included, that, that are, have a large overlap, you will have less shrinkage because they will have very similar treatment effect estimates. <laughs>
Hi, Bjorn. Yes? I have a question. Um, is it not to your advantage to just fit as many subgroups as you can possibly come up with? I mean, if in this, the, if, in if this method, there would be a penalty for that because uh, you would split your prior probabilities in more spaces. That means your posterior weight for any specific group will get smaller, so you will have more shrinkage towards the overall effect. But if most of them are zero, have zero posterior probability, then you won't get much penalty. Yeah, but in practice that will not, will almost never be the case because the data are not, let's say, they are not clear enough to, to be able to say that there's one specific um, subgroup. So typically it's like you have a lot of models that have still have some posterior probability and then there are a few sticking out. But for those few sticking out, um, they're still downweighted by, 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 the other, by the other models. I mean, if you have perfect data, then you would never have downweighting. But we don't have perfect data, I think. It's fair to say. In terms of implementation, you can do that in a fully Bayesian manner with bugs and jacks. And you can also do it just using ML estimation and then using BIC uh, model weights. When you do that, of course, you cannot have prior information on the parameters, but you could have prior weights on the, on the different models. But in, in, in what I'll show you later on, we'll just use equal model weights. And you could also extend this model averaging to also include the model where there's no differential effect of subgroup. So you just have a, the standard model where, the, you know, where everyone has the same effect and use this, throw this also in the, uh, in the, in the in the bunch of models for your model averaging, then you have even further shrinkage towards the overall effect. But actually, it's not, not necessary to have, to have shrinkage. OK, let's come to, to resampling. I think this is a more, more traditional idea. Here, you would, you would split the data into training and test. You perform the subgroup identification on the training data. And then you could just observe, you know, what is your effect in the training data? And it, this will include the optimism due to the selection. And you compare it to the test data. And you can see you get a, somehow you get an idea for the bias that your selection might induce. And uh, we implemented this here in a bootstrap approach where you would resample the data. And for every bootstrap data set, of course, you have some samples that are not uh, in the bootstrap data set, so the out of back uh, samples. And you can use those as a test data set. So again. You bootstrap, you perform the selection of the subgroup in S on the original data. You calculate the treatment effect in the training or identification sample and the test sample. And the difference between these two things gives you an idea of the bias you might expect. That's at least the idea. You can take the mean, and this might be a way of coming up with a bias corrected estimate. Uh, this is the idea of this RS bias, what we'll call like this, and what follows. And then there's a more, more let's say, sophisticated approach. I will not talk much about it here. It's a 0.632 bootstrap, where you essentially weight the original estimate and the estimate uh, over the uh, in the test sample. Then the next approach is also more traditional in the way, well, instead of footing multiple models, you, we know that we have a multivariate problem, so why not fit the multivariate regression? So you can just include all of the covariates on the on the intercept and all of the covariates on the sl slope parameter, the treatment effect here. And of course, if you fit this model, this will, be, this will get unstable and it would be overfitting the data. So you need to do a little bit more, something a little bit better. And then the lasso is one way of doing that where you'd not just minimize the residual sum of squares, but you minimize this plus some penalty term. And this penalty term um, penalizes essentially your your, your um, covariate effects here um, towards zero. That means only if the data support um, a non-zero effect, this will be actually different from zero because the lasso really estimates parameters exactly to zero. So it's not like a continuous thing. It sometimes it exactly estimates parameters to be zero. And then the question is, of course, about this tuning parameter, lambda. Uh, and this is typically determined by cross-validation. And that's also what we used in the simulation here. And we did not shrink the intercept or the treatment effect estimate, just the um, covariate effects. 
Now, how can you come up with a treatment effect estimate for a given subgroup? Well, you can do the same trick as for model averaging. You just predict um, the treatment effect for every patient in the subgroup and then take the average over all patients in the subgroup, and then you have a prediction for that uh, treatment effect in the subgroup. The shrinkage comes from the fact that you shrink the beta 3k here towards zero. Yeah, because the extreme case, of course, would be if you shrink here everything towards zero, this model just reduces to the model where you have an overall treatment effect and no subgroup effect. So that's when you have um, no differential treatment effect. And then, now, now these are three very different methods. Um, they induce shrinkage by very different approaches. And maybe just one slide on, on like, before we go to simulation results on, on how, how they are different. One thing is that the resampling methods, they adjust for a specific selection mechanism. So whatever selection mechanism you use, you will get different treatment, adjust, uh, treatment effect adjustments, which makes sense if you think about it. On the other hand, this model averaging and model, this penalized multivariate regression they don't just depend on the specific selection mechanism. The shrinkage comes more from the sort of the modeling assumptions that you make. But you could think that's good or bad, because here with this approach, you will only be able to come up with inference for a particular selected group. Here you can come up with inference essentially for any group that you're interested in. So you can just, whatever group you're interested in, you would predict the effect for that group. Whereas here, it's really depending on the selection. And another thing is, where I'm not 100% sure it's really possible that you can really 100% algorithmic pre-specify a subgroup selection rule in a phase in an early phase study. I don't think it's I don't think it's it, it's really possible. So, yeah. Okay, so let's come to the simulations. <clears throat> so that's the model that we simulated from. Uh, so there were no prognostic covariates, um, and the treatment effect was determined by some function g that depended on a covariate, continuous covariate. Uh, so we generated candidate covariates, k, k, uh, according to a standard normal distribution, but just the first one determines the treatment effect for a specific patient. So only the covariate x1 here has a predictive effect, but if you, if you look at the data set, of course, you will see an overall effect and you would see also an effect for other subgroups, but it's only due to the overlap of the other subgroup with X1 here. So we looked in a lot of settings. I will not show you all the results. Uh, so we looked in different sample size, 50 and 500, num different number of covariates, a different overall effect. So when you have um, convincing an overall, um, treatment effect, if you have not such a convincing overall treatment effect, and if you have no treatment effect, and then different forms of the treatment effect function. So this is this G here uh, that I showed before. And then essentially the delta here determines the slope um, of, of, of the G. Sorry, I got uh, yeah. I was wondering if you're going to get a sensible model if, if you don't shrink B2 and B3 together. So you might have a model where you've got a sub subgroup yeah. effect in the control and not treatment. I'm wondering whether it's better to maybe have the, the penalization on the addition of those two parameters. On so the you addition? want to shrink them both together? Hmm. Do you mean penalizing on the sum of the two parameters? Yeah. Hmm. At least you then have like a, a consistent idea of Mm. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you could also argue even that you only shrink for the predictive effects and not for the prognostic effects. But yeah, I don't know. We haven't tried that. I cannot. Maybe, maybe a good idea. OK, and for the simulations, what we did, we did some subgroup identification algorithm that we think might represent practice relatively way, I, well. I, we don't think, you know, this is not what we propose. This is just you know, to have one method for identification, and we use this like this. So for each covariate, we define three candidate subgroups based on the three quartiles. And we looked at the p-value for the interaction test across all covariates and all 
candidate quartiles and then selected one group. I think, as I said, I don't think this might be the best approach, but we did it here because you know, the main purpose is about the treatment effect adjustment and not about the identification. And these are the methods um, that we looked at. So naive is the approach where you select the model. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, you select the model, um, and you just use this one model for your inference. So that's, I think, the more or less the standard approach. Then the model averaging estimator. Then this 0.632 resampling-based estimator. Maybe we skip the, this first. This is the way you try to estimate the bias and subtract it from your estimate. And then the lasso. And then they see one method that I didn't talk about. It's also a model averaging method, but it's a resampling based model averaging. It's rather similar in terms of the idea to the first method. OK, let's start with the bias. Uh, so that's the bias for estimating the treatment effect in the selected group. So you select a group that has a certain treatment effect. How far are you off in terms of bias with this selected group? You can see that for the naive estimate, as expected, you see in the positive bias and over-optimism. And of course, the more groups that you look at, the higher the bias gets. The less effect you have in total, the higher the bias gets, because it's more likely that you find noise uh, in, in your modeling. And I think in terms of the other methods, you can see that I think particularly these three here work pretty well. They are also positively biased um, if there is no effect, but I think Bias is much better than if you use just a naive estimate. <clears throat> and what's also interesting to see that it's more or less independent on the, you know, the, the K that you look at. So the performance doesn't get worse if you have more covariates. More or less, particularly for the model averaging, it stays more or less the same. And this is because you have some implicit penalty for, for how many models you're looking at. I think the lasso is maybe a bit too conservative. Um, so for if there's no effect, it works perfect. But then if you have a larger effect, you see some negative bias as well. And then this uh, approach where you try to estimate the bias, I don't think it's working. Uh, this last one, it's almost, I mean, it's a bit better than the naive approach, but you know, it's almost like you know, the same off, but in the wrong direction. So I think this naive estimating the bias by bootstrap, I don't think it, doesn't, it, it works. So the same story if you just look at the mean squared error for the selected subgroup. Um, so these methods here, these three at least, they outperform this naive method in terms of mean square error. Um, Lasso, again, depends on the scenario. And then this RS bias actually doesn't really work very well. The last metric that I'd like to show is the uh, Confidence intervals, I didn't talk how, but you can calculate confidence intervals or credible intervals, however you might like to call it. Um, and you can see for the naive estimate, um, and you, if you increase the number of subgroups that you look at, you get a decreased coverage of your confidence interval that's due to the bias that's getting in, you, in your estimate. Actually, for the model averaging, that's more or less, um, it's coming from Bayesian ideas, you can see that the coverage actually is pretty much close to the nominal level. Um, and also the resampling estimates. The lasso, again, depends on the scenario, how well it performs. But this RS bias, again, doesn't, doesn't work so well. <coughs> Conclusion. I think there are a lot of methods working better than the naive approach. I don't think there's one method working better than all others. There are a few methods available that perform better. I don't know why they shouldn't be used more. That's it. <laughs>